Welcome to Discovering. Across the UP are historic interpretive sites that help us learn and appreciate our local history. Have you ever wondered who puts in the time and effort to create these? How much work goes into the process? Who writes these interpretive signs that you read? Of course, it varies from site to site, and tonight we follow the five-year process of one community who wants to share their lumbering history with others so that history is not forgotten. So sit back and relax. It's Monday night and it's time for Upper Michigan's very own Discovering. The secret streams that flow beneath the cliffs of colored stone. Forest thick and healthy with birds and pine and oak Surrounded by the greatest lakes this world has ever known The black bear's awesome presence as he roams the hills and fields Call of the timber wolf The loon's lonesome trill The eagle soaring high above The trout lies deep and still these are what I treasure The only way I measure Feelings that I have for this fine land There is so much to discover When you're a long-time lover Of northern Michigan Over the course of five years, I followed the process of creating this historic trail in Chassel from concept to completion, which was actually seven years in the making. This unassuming piece of wetland along Chassel Bay was once the site of the Worcester and Sturgeon River Lumber Mill. Over the last century, nature has reclaimed this site, and it's hard to imagine that this was once the site of an enormous and bustling lumber mill. But with today's technology and a dedicated group of volunteers and students, it's easier to imagine what once stood here. First, let's travel back in time to 2019 when I first met up with the project leaders to talk about the history and take a snowshoe through the site. It was originally the Sturgeon River Mill, which was built in 1887, and it's really why Chassel is here. Uh, the town grew up directly around the mill, hence the town that Lumber built uh, is a name for Chassel. Um, so you can see the importance of the mill in the town itself. That operated until 1902 um, when the softwood resources, um, so pine and things like that, were depleted from the area. And Charles Worcester out of Chicago purchased the mill um, in, in its entirety and then started accessing hardwood resources through the construction of the rail lines. And that then ran until 1928. My uh, great-grandfather was superintendent of the mill and uh, was hired by Mr. Worcester and ran the mill and the, the lumber lands for Mr. Worcester for the duration of the period that the Worcester family owned the mill. There's nothing really left of the mill itself. There are a few foundations. Um, there's a giant sawdust pile that may smoke every once in a while on a very hot summer day. You can see a few elements of the pier that's still standing in the water, but there's not much left as far as the built landscape of the mill itself. So creating a walking trail allows people to wander through the history. Well, this is something that grew out of our five-year recreation plan uh, process. We started by surveying our citizens uh, to get a sense for what their interests were. And, and in that process, we learned that our, our citizens were very interested in seeing trails established. Uh, one of our members of our planning commission, uh, Doug Hamer, uh, owns the old mill site where we were looking at ways to enhance outdoor activity and recreational facilities uh, and activities in the township. And in regards to the actual mill site itself, because it's so overgrown, I think a lot of people have lost touch with the fact that that had a very prominent uh, position and place in the community. So the thought just came to mind, why not open it up as an interpretive trail for people so that they can uh, come to understand better what that mill meant in terms of a physical presence in the community. Anything to get people outside. Go for a walk. Learn a little bit about the town that you live in while you're on that stroll. 
one thing to see it in a picture, but it's another thing to actually walk yeah. all the way through there and think, you know, just to get a sense of the size of how big this mill was and the storage it needed for all the lumber it cut. Right. From here, our next steps are to start developing a full budget as far as the creation of a possible boardwalk. For parts of the trails, this is moving through a wetland area. It's easier to have a boardwalk than trying to drain it or something like that. There was also an elevated steam line that ran through the mill. We're hoping to actually locate the boardwalk on where that steam line may have ran. Like everything, 2020 delayed progress, and in the fall of 2021, Work to clear the trail and prep the site for future boardwalks was underway. I'll tell you what, trying to figure out where to put this trail in was quite a challenge when we got started. I mean, when you start, you know, crawling through a wetland that's full of tag alder and, <laughs> and all kinds of other brush, it's it's quite a challenge to, to map out a trail. But, uh, you know, we've made numerous trips over the last couple of years trying to figure out what the best layout would be. and. And you know, once once we were in here with the chainsaws, it, it really became pretty clear, you know, how how best to lay it out. Interpretive sign here, which uh, you know will interpret the uh, hot pond for the mill. And of course, this is where the sawmill stood, right on this uh, location right here. So, what we've been doing today, we've we've had uh, four uh, North Country Trail Sawyers who volunteered today: Mark Roberts, Ken Rubin, and John Diebel, and myself. And uh, what we've done is uh, brushed out a corridor for the trail, which is going to at least go over this upland portion, which where, where the sawmill once stood, and then uh, it, there'll be the corridor from there through the wetland. And uh, we're in the process of getting our EGLE permit, uh, which will then allow uh, a boardwalk to be constructed uh, across that uh, portion of the trail. This ended up being like the best act up point Pretty much running right over the spot where the uh, logs would have been coming into the uh, sawmill. So you can see the base of the foundation. As they cleared the trail, hidden ruins of the old buildings became more visible. So the boardwalk would start right here because uh, we're entering the wetland right here. With as dry as the summer has been this year, uh, it's, it's bone dry out here right now. Old maps like this 1908 Sanborn fire map help the team figure out where the sawmill buildings were at on the property. Again, just to uh, kind of recap, we had a saw, there was a sawmill out here, uh, a shingle mill, a lath mill, and uh, as well as a planing mill. We're probably gonna have to take out this uh, uh, tree here. It's not too badly rotted yet, but that's, that tree is recently, you know, probably drowned out here and, uh, you know, due to the wetland conditions. So we've already taken down one really large uh, dead tree, which really presented a pretty significant hazard. Being a wetland, I mean, it's a, there's plenty of habitat out here. I mean, we've been trying as best we can to protect, you know, a lot of the fruiting uh, trees out here and bushes, uh, you know, because certainly that's something that, you know, supports the bird population out here. And, it's just so cool how this has been reclaimed by nature. I mean, when you, especially when you look at old photographs of, of the mill, I mean, it's, it, it's just amazing that you could have such a green space uh, in its place at this time. From my understanding, this is where the offices stood on the site, probably one of the more significant ruins that we have here on the site that uh, uh, will be interpreted as part of the trail out here. The research for those interpretive signs is being done by Chassel High School history students, who are also there to help clear the trail. Really appreciate all of your willingness to come out and help us out with the project. I, I think it's something the community is going to be really proud of. You know, once it's uh, you know finally in place, and uh, and it, it's kind of cool to be able to have a hand in it. Probably one of the most exciting things about this project is the partnership that we've been able to assemble uh, between the Chassel Historical Organization, uh, the Industrial Archaeology Program at Michigan Technological University, uh, as well as the Chassel Township Schools. So we've been involved in compiling a lot of the research uh, that will eventually be edited and revised to put on the signs. We really gained a lot of steam last year with a, a dedicated local history elective class that uh, did some research in the spring there, Re well really for a good portion of last year, on the various stopping points on the, on the path here. And we're really excited about getting going on 
actually blazing through the trail here and, and getting another group involved in, in some research for these historical so, uh, spots on the mill site. We're learning more about our community and what we can do to better it. We're clearing out the trail. It's an interpretive trail that we're going to have here soon. And we're just clearing out the bush and sticks to kind of make it a nice path to walk through. I want to say it's going to be three years, probably this coming winter, that we since we you know started down the path with the project. And if uh, if everything works out with getting our EGLE permit timely this fall, and if the weather holds up, our hope is is that the uh, the boardwalk itself can be constructed uh, before winter this year. As these things go, the trail project took longer than anticipated as the group worked to secure funding and permits. In December 2022, the boardwalks were finally installed over the wetland sections. Just getting the approvals necessary from the EGLE, we worked very closely uh, with Hunter King from EGLE to make application for and ultimately get approved for those permits, uh, which you know were required to, to construct these boardwalks in here. And so uh, that was a project that DP Construction here in Chassel undertook for us. Why are we building in the winter? Well, just the way the uh, permits and the, and the grant process worked. So uh, we want to complete by January 1st. So we're here today and it's 90% uh, complete. There's 400 feet of a uh, boardwalk, five feet wide, with the railing system, as you can see. The challenges were uh, we, we were not allowed to take equipment in here because it's wetlands, so pretty much had to hand dig all the holes and, uh, and walk through the swamp. She's looking for somebody to talk about sisu digging these holes. It's a process. We'll talk to Steve. <laughs> <laughs> it's a process. Get it, and plus it's cold out here now, so. That adds to the challenge of completing the project. And the interpretive signs were almost complete. We started working with Terry Frew, uh, who teaches uh, art and design class at Michigan Tech. She happened to have nine students in her class, and that was consistent with the number of signs that we had on the trail. My name's Terry Frew, and I'm teaching faculty with the Visual and Performing Arts Department at Michigan Tech. My students are using their graphic design skills that they learned in my class to illustrate wayfinding and interpretation signs for the historical trail that we're currently on. The designs are varied. Uh, each student was responsible for one point on the trail, and uh, just you know, just as every artist has their individual vision, they they've brought their individual visions to them and. Um, there, there's a commonality to many of them in that we had a, a hike through the trail earlier in the season. It didn't look quite like this, but uh, it was still beautiful and they took inspiration from that. So I feel like that's sort of a common thread running through the, many of the designs. So we're in the, the final edits. We received feedback from the board uh, of the historical trail and just putting the, the finishing touches on them uh, to be delivered to the printer soon. And then ultimately those went to industrial graphics uh, where they were printed up. And on these signs, you will notice a QR code that helps you step back in time and see what was happening here in the early 1900s. It's not quite the DeLorean, but as close to time travel as we can get today, and it is pretty cool. What we're looking at here is the 1908 Sanborn map. You can see the blue dot. So like when you click on this uh, part, part of the screen, it'll pull that up so your phone will ping against the map. So as you can see right now, we're like right on the edge of the sorting platform. Uh, and then as we would walk through it, we could, you know, if we walked on these ruins, we could see exactly, you know, where the shingle mill was at. And then we could also pick up where the sawmill was at. To learn more about the Keweenaw Time Traveler, I visited the apps developers at Michigan Tech University. I'm Don Lafreniere. I'm an associate professor of geography and GIS, and I'm also the department chair here in social sciences at, at Michigan Technological University, and I'm the director of the Keweenaw Time Traveler Project. The Keweenaw Time Traveler Project is a project where we're mapping uh, the places and people of the Keweenaw from the 1880s through to present, where we're producing maps, uh, historical maps, and mapping where everybody used to live, work, and play 
uh, in the Keweenaw and giving uh, all of that available to the public to be able to learn more about the history and heritage of the area. There's so much about the Keweenaw Time Traveler, it's really exciting. Uh, among them is the ability to be out in the landscape, to be walking around and seeing some of the uh, you know, historical mining and lumber operations that, that uh, used to exist or some of the towns that are no longer uh, in their full size and to be able to really see what um, the Keweenaw used to look like. And so as you're walking around and you see uh, footprints of buildings, you can actually bring up your phone and see what, what those things used to be. And not just see it at one point in time, but you can see how it changed throughout time and how the environments of the Keweenaw have been changing through time. Here we have a representation of what the lumber mill uh, in Chester looked like in 1908. And so uh, we've got uh, the main uh, sort of tramway and railway uh, operations happening here. The planning mill, this is a lumber dock that's actually sitting offshore. And if we sort of drag this back, you can see that this, this would have been out in the water here. Um, and, and you can see all the different operations. We have offices here and tool houses. And then this is the large sort of sorting platform, which you can imagine if you were living in Chassel um, or coming by, by boat uh, along the waterfront, this would have been piled 300 feet tall with, and in fact, there's some, some mentions of that on the map, uh, uh, full of lumber. And that lumber was being used all over the UP and beyond. It was ship being shipped down to Chicago and, and other places around the Midwest, uh, all coming from, from the timberlands here in the UP, being produced right here locally in Chassel. Um, here's a sawmill, for example, uh, gives you some information about the diff where the different saws were and the different kinds of band saws that were available. A uh, shingle mill here for producing shingles for roofs. Um, and then how all of these operations sort of connected to the waterway, which is where they were primarily moving the, uh, the timber that came into the mill itself. So, and in addition, which is really nice about these maps that we use in the Keweenaw Time Traveler, is it's not just about the industrial sites, but sort of how the industrial sites connect to the community, which is where the workers were living. So this here is the Chassel House, which was a residential hotel where uh, workers would be living while they were working uh, at the mill and other locations around town. The signs were installed in the summer of 2023, and the trail officially opened at last year's Strawberry Festival. It's been very cool to watch this transformation of this place into something that people can come out and, and actually visit and learn from. None of that would have been made possible at all if, if it hadn't been for uh, some very generous financial support from the John and Melissa Bessie Foundation, because that helped us with the costs of both the boardwalks as well as the uh, interpretive signs here on the trails. I think one of the things that's been really valuable about getting this trail in place has been, you know, to, to really highlight this history that's associated with the timber and, and lumber processing uh, industry, which sometimes, you know, we, I think it plays serious second fiddle to the copper mining industry. So I think this has been a great opportunity to, you know, not only preserve that history, but to create a broader awareness, not only of the existence of this industry here in, in the region, um, but, you know, the, but how it plays into individuals' families' histories here in the region. The trail is open year round. Just come into uh, Centennial Park. Can't miss the sign there as you're uh, coming through Chassel on the east side of the street. Uh, you know, pull in uh, to the pavilion and then uh, immediately turn right in front of the pavilion and, and drive to the parking lot on the south side of it and you'll find the trailhead sign uh, at the southwest corner and then just follow the directional arrows. The length of the entire trail is four-tenths of a mile. So it's not a very long trail uh, but it's a beautiful place to come through. I mean as you can see behind me here we've got some very tall wetland grasses this time of year. It's a great place if you're into watching birds. Uh, you'll see all of, quite a variety of birds out here and you'll see the occasional deer out here as well. Uh, we were just talking with somebody who'd seen some blue heron uh, out at the hot pond site as well. And so again, a, a, just a, view, a beautiful place. It's a quiet and just hard to imagine that it was a bustling industrial complex at one point in time.
that's all for tonight, and I hope to see you right back here next week for Upper Michigan's very own Discovering. 